I'm John Banther, and this is Classical Breakdown. From WETA Classical in Washington, we are your guide to classical music. In this episode, I'm joined by WETA Classical's Evan Keeley to talk all about the life and music of one of the most famous composers of all time, George Friedrich Handel. We dispel a myth or two about his early life, explore what made him so popular, and why he became such a favorite for composers like Mozart and Beethoven. Plus, stay with us to the end as we have three things to tell you about Handel you probably didn't know. Handel is one of those composers, Evan, that I actually forget I really like because it's just about every week I have to focus my attention on different composers or music or time periods. Then I hear some of Handel's music and I remember how much I like it. And there's so much of it. Astonishingly prolific composer and uh, so much of his music is just so fantastic. It is. So in this episode, we'll explore his life, how he became one of the most celebrated living composers, and we have three things that you probably did not know about him, plus some music recommendations too. The first thing you probably did not know is that he was born in 1685. Maybe you knew that, but maybe you didn't know that he was born the same year as Johann Sebastian Bach, which is fascinating because they're both born the same year, pretty close to each other too, and together became emblematic of the entire Baroque period, yet they never even met. That's just so crazy. Uh, Handel traveled around quite a bit. Uh, Bach, of course, did not much more of a provincial composer in his time. There's uh, there's some reason to believe Bach wanted to go and meet Handel, but somehow it never materialized. Could you imagine the two of them sitting down and, you know, having a beer and talking about music? I mean, just to be a fly on the wall, but it never happened. And there's some differences in their music we might mention along the way, too. One of which I think is just the dramaticism that Handel brings to the table, often with means of economy. There's some quotes of Beethoven and Mozart. Uh, Beethoven said, the master of us all, the greatest composer that ever lived. I would uncover my head and kneel before his tomb. He also said, go to him to learn how to achieve great effects by such simple means. And I like that, great effects, and he does it with such simple means. There's a story that Beethoven, uh, lying on his deathbed, uh, there was a, a shelf with the collected works of Handel on the bookshelf, and he pointed to it and said, there lies the truth. Whether or not that actually happened, we do know for certain. Beethoven really admired, loved Handel's music. I think I'll do that myself. I'll I'll say the same thing, but inside the book will be empty or something. I'll leave a a bigger (laughs) mystery. Mozart allegedly said, Handel understands affect better than any of us. When he chooses, he strikes like a thunderbolt. I love that as well. I think a modern non-musical comparison, Evan, might be Johann Sebastian Bach would be Steve Wozniak and Handel would be Steve Jobs. They're both geniuses. Bach lives that humble provincial life you mentioned, more secluded, doesn't travel much. Handel, he seeks fame and fortune, and he wanted to do it his own way. It's incredible to us today to recognize that Bach, J.S. Bach as a composer, wasn't really well recognized in his time. Uh, Handel, on the other hand, was an international superstar. Absolutely. So tell us, Evan, a little bit about his his early life, his um, birth and and family. Well, we think of Handel as an English composer because he lived in England so much of his life. But of course, he's actually German. And this is in the era when Germany is a region rather than a nation. But he was born in the Saxony region of Germany, 1685, Georg Friedrich Handel. Uh, as his German name as he was born. His father was a barber surgeon and uh, served uh, various persons of high social rank. So Handel, uh, from the beginning of his life, was exposed to uh, social circles of very wealthy and powerful and influential people while not being directly a part of that milieu. And you see this tension throughout his life where he's He's not one of the uh, aristocrats of society, but he's certainly connected to that world. We don't know a whole lot about his early life. Uh, There are uh, various stories about his early life which are maybe untrue. Uh, John Mainwaring was the first uh, biographer of Handel, wrote a biography of Handel in the uh, 
late 18th century, I think, was the year. And uh, there's a lots of lots of fanciful stories in that biography, which we now think are probably untrue. One of the most memorable of which is that uh, Handel, as a boy, was very interested in music, and his father was adamantly opposed to his son becoming a musician. And so young George Frederick Handel had to go hide up in the attic where there was a keyboard instrument, and he would clandestinely play the instrument and teach himself uh, about music. Uh, we now think that's probably not a true story. His his father may have had some ambivalence about his son uh, getting into music, but uh, did support his uh, musical studies to some extent, and uh, and we see the result. There's no doubt Handel uh, had to face some challenges growing up uh, in the uh, situation that he was in and wanting to be a musician, but clearly he figured out how to overcome them. Definitely. And that story, it sounds so great. Handel, this little boy, saves up money, gets this keyboard into the attic, practices at night while everyone's asleep. Of course, it sounds crazy. I mean, these houses back then, I mean, they were probably built quite well. A lot of them still stand, I think. But I mean, come on, you're playing a harpsichord instrument in in your attic. Everyone's going to wake up. (laughs) So then when he's around age 10, he starts to study with the only teacher that we know of, uh, Friedrich Wilhelm Zakhoff. He gave Handel a strong foundation in counterpoint, fugues, and um, canons, really the basis of the Baroque period. And he had him study other composers in a way that I think still continues, and that is just copying out scores of other composers, specifically one Johann Krieger, who I didn't know at all, but who wrote some really nice music. And this is great because you're writing it all out and you're seeing in a more close, personal way how all the music and lines and everything kind of fits together. And it sounds like then... Handel was able to start filling in for his teacher for church services, playing the organ, and allegedly writing music too. We don't have any examples or real records of these early sacred works, but a description from another composer, Johann Matheson, said, Handel in those days set very, very long arias and sheerly unending cantatas, which, while not possessing the proper knack or correct taste, were perfect so far as harmony is concerned. This is very, I think this is fun. He's writing arias and cantatas that are just um, too long. I can imagine just really stretching things out, thinking he's doing something. But I also like that this is the same composer, I think, that got into like a street brawl with Handel, right? Like decades later, they got into like a straight up altercation. Matheson, another fine composer of that era, not as well remembered as I think he should be. The story is uh, uncertain, but uh, one version of the story is they got into a duel and uh, that uh, Matheson, uh, you know, aimed his sword at Handel's bosom and uh, a button on Handel's uh, cloak happened to deflect the sword and he would have died otherwise. Again, this is maybe one of those romantic stories that may or may not be true. They, they clearly had some tensions between them, but uh, when they weren't fighting, they admired one another very much. And I like that. They did admire each other. Maybe they got in a fight and got over it. But even still, imagine pulling a sword on someone and then still saying, hey, his harmony is fantastic. Um, <laughs> well, Handel, of course, composing from an early age. Again, we don't have a lot of uh, evidence of what he composed as a young person. But there is reason to believe that these uh, this copying exercises that he did uh, as a teenager and as a boy, uh, you know, there's reason to believe he carried that book with him for the rest of his life, that he hung on to those copies. That, th- that exercise of copying other composers' work was so important to him that he retained that uh, the physical evidence and he clearly retained it in his intellect. One of the early works that we know of his, a setting of Laudate Pueri Dominum, they think it's around 1701. He's probably 15, 16 around there when he may have written this. And I really like this. There's a particular moment I love in the first section of this. It's very fast and rhythmic, lots of eighth notes and sixteenth notes. It's driving forward, and the singer is doing the same. But then he has the singer pop up to this higher note, and it's a little longer than you expect, and then it gives the opportunity to settle on it briefly before jumping and continuing into the next phrase. I think this is that affect quality Mozart was talking about. He's doing so much and then he captivates us for a moment with just this subtle change. This is uh, one of the aspects, I think, of Handel's music, that he's able to do these things which are simultaneously surprising and yet seem somehow indispensable. Like the thing that you least expect happens, and then you feel like, well, that was the only thing that could have happened. 
Yes. And uh, he's able to keep our, uh, he's able to re- maintain this sort of this sense of fascination that he brings to our experience by constantly beguiling us with these wonderful little surprises and these twists. He, he's writing mostly in a very conventional style. He's writing in the style that other composers in Western Europe were writing in at this time. And yet he's able to infuse it with these wonderful little uh, astonishing qualities that just keep us drawn to his music. In 1697, Handel's father dies, and then he enrolls at the university in Halle, correct? And that's where he's in close proximity to Leipzig, and he meets another big composer from this time period, Georg Philipp Telemann. It's interesting because they met once, and I assume this kind of happened a lot back, you know, hundreds of years ago. They met once, but then were great friends and corresponded through the mail for the rest of their lives, sending scores, giving advice, and even gifts. Handel sent Telemann hard-to-find plants when Telemann got into um, gardening later in life. Makes you wonder, what would he have sent Bach if they had met? Oh, if only we knew. But uh, Handel and Telemann, both great composers, and they both understood each other's genius, I think. Tell us about his first opera, then, Almira, because as we'll discover, like Mozart, we enjoy his a lot of his instrumental music, but he really achieved fame and success in the opera world. And this is, uh, this is a thing that's a goal for Handel through uh, this sort of first portion of his adult life. He's writing instrumental music, he's writing orchestral music, he's writing keyboard music, he's writing cantatas. But what he really wants to do is be successful as an opera composer. There's probably a number of reasons for that. Uh, It was a great way to, uh, you know, opera, a successful opera was very lucrative. You know, if you have a a popular set of keyboard pieces that are selling well, that's great. But if you can sell uh, opera performances, you can really make a fortune. Much like today, if you're a composer, uh, you know, if you really want to make a lot of money, you want to have a big hit on Broadway, for instance. Mm -hmm. So analogous to that, Handel wants to uh, be successful as an opera composer. But I think more than just the commercial aspects of it, more than just wanting to make money, he, I think, really was drawn to the operatic stage because of the dramatic propensities of his creativity. He really is able to paint a picture of a scene in his music. Even if it's like a solo keyboard work, there's a sense of drama and struggle in so much of his music. And what better place to show those talents, to, to showcase those capabilities of his as a composer than on the operatic stage. And of course, opera in the early 18th century throughout Europe, uh, with the, I think, notable exception of the French, people that want to hear opera are mostly interested in Italian opera. The Italian opera still has that prestige throughout the world. Even audiences that don't know the Italian language want to hear Italian opera, not only because of the language, but because of the styles of Italian opera. That have, and of course, opera at this point is about a hundred years old as an art form which, uh, you know, is really still pretty new in a way, and there's still innovations that are being developed And Handel is really interested in exploring this medium and what he can do with it creatively. I love hearing your description of all this because it also reminds me of, as you said, opera is basically, it's like 100 years old, and back then things are changing really slow. It reminds me of film almost. It must have been a really exciting time for opera in that it was new, almost felt like Hollywood-esque. You know, the biggest names, uh, the biggest stars, they were all in, involved in um, in this. So it seems natural that he went to what might have been like the Hollywood of, of opera, as you were talking about Italian opera. He goes to Italy himself in 1706. And again, more information we don't know. We don't know who invited him to Italy. I imagine he didn't just show up on his own um, with a suitcase getting off a bus like he's in New York City to make it as a star. Yeah, there's reason to believe that someone in the Medici family invited him. We're not sure which person in the family. Different accounts have different uh, speculations about that. But like you say, he didn't just go on his own. Someone clearly was aware of him. Even uh, here he is, 1706. He's maybe 20, 21 years old. Still, uh, you know, just getting started, but clearly a talent that people are paying attention to. And he goes to various places in Italy. He spends some time in Florence and in Rome. Uh, He goes to Naples. He goes to Venice. You can really imagine the extraordinary music that he's able to be exposed to, uh, both in terms of getting his hands on scores, but of course, more importantly, uh, hearing performances and even meeting composers and exchanging ideas with them. And you can see the uh, creative impact of this throughout the rest of his life. It seems like this was also a key aspect in him him learning more about dramaticism because there was this ban on opera 
in in Rome and the the papal states. So uh, the Pope it was a decree from uh, the Pope. And at the time, the opera vacuum was seemingly filled with cantatas and or oratorios. That is, works for orchestra and chorus. There's singers, soloists, but no staging, no costumes, which would have been very, very elaborate. So it sounds like Handel is able to color within the lines and really learn rules, but really learn how to be dramatic in、um, in those ways, dramatic in those economic means. Right. When you don't have a visual like a stage or a costume. You have to convey drama all the more powerfully, and oratorio,、uh, very often、uh, sacred subjects in oratorios, although not always. And a lot of these cantatas that Handel is writing at this time, we hear the word cantata in the Baroque, we often think of J.S. Bach, and those are liturgical、uh, cantatas or church music. The cantatas Handel's writing in Italy are not that; they are a, a secular art form. Uh, usually a solo voice and a small instrumental ensemble, and very often the poetry that is being said is like a love poem or something full of emotion. And so he's portraying these characters in these scenes in these short cantatas that are、uh, full of drama and passion. And he's developing his skill as a dramatist through this medium. One work that I highly recommend from this time period is La Resurrezione, the Resurrection. It's an oratorio he wrote that is absolutely worth hearing. For me, it embodies a lot of the qualities I love in the Baroque period. It's it's bright, it's、um, rich. the The timbre is very very colorful, very shiny aspects to it. And he has just some virtuosic writing for the oboe, and we learned in our "What Is an Oboe" episode just how rudimentary the instrument was at this time. So he's writing very virtuosic lines for it. Wonder who was actually playing those, because it was a bit of an outlier for his time. It would be,、uh, I think, a couple of decades before someone like Vivaldi was writing really difficult lines for the oboe. So that's one I definitely recommend from this time. So. His time in Italy comes to an end around 1710, and he makes his way to England. But by way of Hanover, he's Kapellmeister there for not even a year. Right? He gets there, and then basically, as soon as he finishes,、um, not even a year, he just goes to London. Yeah, so he goes back to Germany after his sojourn in Italy.、Uh, we're not sure why he didn't want to stay there, but he gets a job as the Kapellmeister for the Elector of Hanover, Prince Georg. Uh, which you think is a pretty prestigious gig.、Uh, this is a high-ranking aristocrat.、Uh, Handel probably has access to a lot of really skilled musicians, but for reasons that are unclear, he only remains there not even a full year, and then finds his way to London. And in London, he starts、uh, working more on this、uh, medium of Italian opera that he's so interested in, with、uh, the first Italian language opera written for a British opera company, Rinaldo. A、uh, great success for Handel in 1711, and so this becomes a permanent settlement for Handel, becoming an actual、um, English citizen even、um, a few decades later. He also starts to really realize the money that gets thrown around in London. You see this from a few other composers. Haydn, for instance,、um, goes to London, has the symphony played, and is remarking, "They just gave me a ton of money." Handel. Gets 200 pounds a year for several years, which is roughly 37,000 dollars or so today for a piece he wrote for Queen Anne. So he got this yearly payment of that much money for just this one thing, I think, and that's、um, that's a lot of、um, let's say, as you can say, money for old rope. But he lived in 25 Brook Street in London, and Evan, I did not know this until just now. Who lived next door to Handel at 23 Brook Street? Well, of course, he didn't live next door to Handel when Handel was there. But、uh, in the late 1960s, Jimi Hendrix lived at 23 Brook Street,、uh, next door to where Handel had lived. And、uh, nowadays, that building still exists, and、uh, the project is underway to、uh, open. Hopefully, in the spring of 2023, the Handel Hendrix House will be a museum dedicated to exploring the lives of Jimi Hendrix and George Frederick Handel. And that sounds like a fascinating place. Imagine not knowing this, and you go to you see this house, or Handel's house, and then I think they have, they have the offices now are in the flat of Jimi Hendrix. And、uh, you wonder, oh, where do I go to get the ticket or this? Oh yeah, go to Jimi Hendrix's old flat. It's,、uh, it's like <laughs> what, Hendrix?、Um, so that that's I thought that was fascinating. Two great musicians that came to London and、uh, had a lasting impact on that city and on the world. Absolutely. So he didn't write opera for 
um, several years in England, but he was remaining um, uh, busy after that first one you mentioned for um, Rinaldo. And a lot of music we love today, like um, water music, which was music played on this barge for the king going up the River Thames. And apparently he liked it so much they were, they were repeating it. This is a, a piece that without the story, it almost seems like we might not like it as much, although it's an amazing piece of music. But this idea of all these musicians getting on a barge and playing this, I used to live on a barge, so I cannot imagine this happening without some level of calamity. Someone falling over, an instrument falling, spray from the water. I mean, how do you keep your music on a stand in that? All you need is a little wave and your mouthpiece kind of bumps into you in a way that's quite uncomfortable or something like that. But somehow they managed to play it in a way that really pleased the king. And uh, this is one of those wonderful stories which, uh, unlike some of the other romantic tales about Handel, is almost certainly true. Mm -hmm. The king, King George I, had been, prior to being king of England, the elector of Hanover. And Handel, this was the uh, this was the gig that Handel had when he left Germany, kind of skipped out of town and uh, abandoned his old boss, Prince Georg. And when Queen Anne died, uh, she didn't have any uh, legitimate issue, as they say. She didn't have any children. So uh, they had to find some relative who was Protestant who could succeed her. And the closest relative they had was her second cousin, Prince Georg, the elector of Hanover. So this guy who didn't even speak English came across the channel and became King George I. And then Handel is writing this music for this party on the Thames uh, that King George I is throwing in 1717. He, he writes this music, the musicians play it, and the king says, wow, this music is so great. Let's hear it again and again and again. Who wrote this music? And Handel uh, comes forward and apparently uh, the king let bygones be bygones because he liked the music so much. I would be nervous if I was Handel. I mean, I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, what are the odds? I just quit on this guy. Now he's here and I have <laughs> now to... Now he's the king. And I'm on a boat. Oops, burn that bridge. But apparently yeah. he's, his talent was so spectacular, he was able to recover. And also, music for Royal Fireworks, another one that um, would capture everyone's attention. Thousands of people saw the premiere. I think it caused like an hours or days long traffic jam on, a, on the London Bridge. Just imagine a traffic jam of days in the 1700s. That couldn't have been uh, very enjoyable. But, And in fact, we may be talking about those two pieces on a future episode. So Evan, now it's Handel's getting more and more successful, and he starts the Royal Academy of Music, not the school, but an opera company. And in fact, this would be one of three opera companies that he would write. And basically, I think he just kind of became a titan of industry. He wrote five operas, I think five or six before um, this, then he would write 36 operas for um, English audiences. Yes. The Royal Academy of Music, despite the name, which makes it sound like it's some, uh, you know, royal decree or something, it's actually a private business, and it was created by aristocrats in London who had a taste for Italian opera, and they wanted to create a new opera company that would uh, be a, a venue that would provide Italian opera seria, serious uh, Italian opera, and they had a composer like Handel on hand who was a part of that. And what we see with this, uh, this venture, and it is a, a business venture, is that Handel is not only a very skilled composer, of course, but he does have some savvy in terms of business. The Royal Academy of Music uh, did have its ups and downs financially and administratively, but uh, Handel was undeterred and he was able to uh, create ventures like this or be a part of enterprises like this that enabled him to continue to create these masterpieces. And presumably all part of his wanting to be in high society, rubbing shoulders with the, um, the, the big patrons, the dukes or whatever. He was still wanting to be in that circle. And that brings us to this next but related point, and that is a discovery made in 2013 by musicologist David Hunter. He was going through investments, looking at um, just records of things, and he found Handel's investments in the Royal African Company with, quote, two pair of buy and sell orders in 1720, three of the four transactions signed by Handel. Now, the Royal African Company, founded by the British royal family, was the biggest company, if you did not know, when it came to transporting enslaved people to the Americas. This is really a, a very disturbing thing for us to think about. We were talking about Handel wanting to be connected to uh, the wealthy and powerful people in society. It's a reminder that uh, art costs money. It's a uh, 
expensive to make art, especially if you're doing things like opera. It's a very expensive venture. And uh, Handel wants to be connected to this world, which will make it possible for him to create this art that has enriched the world for centuries. But uh, what, uh, in what was he entangled in order to finance these things? Well, one of the things, as we now know, he invested in was the enslavement of human beings being forcibly repatriated out of Africa, which was big business in, uh, in the 18th century and a uh, very lucrative, unfortunately, very lucrative business uh, of this uh, trafficking in human suffering. So it's, it's just a very sobering reminder to us of the ways in which uh, the various enterprises of human activity, whether they're artistic or otherwise, can very easily get entangled in things which are unethical. And it's a re uh, reminder to us that we should really be paying close attention to uh, where the money is coming from for the things that we value. David Hunter also discovered that over 30% of the Royal Academy of Music investors were invested heavily in the RAC, including one of Handel's biggest patrons. And the abolitionist movement wouldn't really start for, for decades in England. And Handel's views, had they been different, would have been an, a, a, quite an outlier in that society. We're going to put a link to the article from Musicology Now, which is what David Hunter wrote. We'll put that on the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org because there's more uh, that he writes about it, and it is, um, it is something that I think people should be reading. There's a quote from Jeanette Sorrell from um, a different article. She is the artistic director of the period instrument ensemble Apollo's Fire. Who's done a, she's done a lot of work, and she is a great interpreter of Handel's music. She said... We can take this news about Handel's investments and look into our own 401ks or whatever we each have. Many people are not paying that much attention to how their investments are specifically allocated, and if we find some of it is supporting fossil fuels, for example, that will affect the lives of billions of people in the next generation. So maybe this can inspire all of us to do something now, today, to make the planet a better place. And we'll get into the second thing you probably did not know about Handel right after this. The second thing people might not know is that Handel's music, specifically his coronation anthem, Zadok the Priest, has been played at every single coronation since 1727. We're coming up on 300 years of that now, Evan. Every single coronation, that's quite a, that's quite a streak. Yeah, I want to say that was the coronation of King George II. And uh, he wrote four of these coronation anthems. Uh, they're still part of the concert repertoire today. I've, I've sung some of them when I was in high school uh, or in college. Uh, they're wonderful, wonderful pieces. Most of them multi-movement pieces, but they're fairly short. They're like a, a, like a short cantata, uh, words from scripture. And uh, we'll have a coronation uh, in the UK uh, sometime in the coming year as Charles III is uh, officially coronated. And I am sure we will hear a Handel coronation anthem at that coronation, as has been the case for, as you said, almost 300 years now. And maybe it's been going on for so long because some of these, especially Zadok the Priest, I mean, it is, they're intense. They're very, very dramatic. It is, yes. um, it definitely displays an air of authority, I think. Yes, definitely adds a, 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 an air of magnificence to the event. And uh, again, this, uh, so many examples of Handel's music surprising us with these virtuosic uh, uh, turns or uh, astonishing twists of harmony or uh, just the, the incredible dramatic power that Handel was able to infuse into his music. So he has these three opera companies He's taking off in the world of opera. He writes 36 for these English audiences, becomes a superstar. One of the big ones it seems like we can talk about, Evan, is his opera Alcina that really showcases some of the things that we've been talking about, affect and just dramaticism. Alcina continues to be uh, one of Handel's best-loved operas, I think for good reasons. Uh, opera houses uh, to this very day still mount productions of it. And it's a, a wonderful example of the not only of the style of the period, but the ways in which Handel was able to really infuse it with something exceptional. So Alcina, the title character, is this uh, evil sorceress who lives on this uh, magical island. She uh, lures heroes there and uh, you know seduces them. And then when she gets bored with her lovers, she turns them into animals. Stop. 
And uh, so it's this fantastical story full of, you know, sorcery and magic and so forth. Really typical of opera and uh, theater of the period, the early 18th century. People liked these kinds of fantastical stories. And a very, uh, a very gifted composer could infuse that with something really exciting, with lots of spectacular, virtuosic music, and audiences would enjoy it. And Handel certainly does that. But in addition to that, in addition to writing things that are just exciting and compelling and fun, he's also able to infuse the characters through his music with a psychological depth. So Alcina, who is this evil sorceress, uh, could just be this sort of cartoon villain, and that might be really enjoyable for us to experience. But he actually gives her this, uh, this, this depth uh, there's a, this one aria that she sings. It's a it's a staple of the, the uh, of the soprano repertoire. It's a very dramatic aria. Ah, mio cor schernito sei. Ah, my heart, you have been you have been uh, deceived. Uh, and it's when she realizes that her lover is uh, is going to abandon her, and she's heartbroken and and she's full of sorrow. But then she expresses this intense rage. And again, this could just be this sort of over the top. Uh, fun, exciting kind of thing, which on some level it is. But what you really hear in Handel's incredible music is this real human sorrow and anger and, uh, and fear that's, uh, that's conveyed with this extraordinary creativity and depth. And uh, he's really able to paint this very intricate psychological portrait through his music. We find this throughout uh, Handel's music, especially in the operas. He's able to create very rich characters with his music. But all good things come to an end, right? Sort of. There was an opera by John Gay in 1728, The Beggar's Opera, which was a, a satirization, a satirical opera on Italian opera. And this is quite fascinating because when I first listened to this recently, I thought, okay, so it's satire you know, maybe something with the, the lyrics. I thought it might be more closer to Italian opera. I mean, it is straight up Saturday Night Live making fun of opera. In bringing it now on the stage. But I see it is time for us to withdraw. The actors are preparing to begin. Play away the overture. Yes. Yes, in a very body kind of, uh, you know, it's not a, it's not an elegant kind of satire. It's, uh, it's, it's just having a raucous good time. And it was very popular. Audiences really responded to this. Uh, you know, it seems like a fascinating contradiction to us that Italian opera would be so popular and yet a satire of it would also be popular. Maybe with some of the same people. Who knows? Also, I think John Gay was born the same year, 1685. Yes. That's also interesting. So you see the competing trends in music. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about the Beggar's Opera is one of the things that it's making fun of is the Da Capo aria. This is a, a core element of Italian opera. You have a, an aria where there's a whole section and then there's a, a contrasting B section and then the A section is entirely repeated. Uh, make it, uh, the staging of uh, Italian operas uh, from this period today quite a challenge because our aesthetic in the early 21st century is so different. You wouldn't, you know, if you think of your favorite musical repeating an entire section of a number, uh, it's just not how our brains are wired these days. Well, the Beggar's Opera makes fun of this uh, and uh, you know, the, the ways in which these things kind of go on doing the same thing over and over again. So Handel, uh, in some of his uh, later works after this, tries to adopt this and fuse it into the realm of serious Italian opera and uh, doesn't seem to have really made a success. Uh, the opera Cerse is uh, an opera that came out of Handel's in 1738, uh, 10 years after the Beggar's Opera. And audiences were really kind of confused by it because you don't see a lot of these da capo arias in Cerse. And people are expecting, maybe they're expecting that in an Italian opera. Uh, Handel's trying to adopt the forms of the, the so-called ballad opera, in that opera, which uh, doesn't seem to have connected with audiences at the time. It's now regarded, Cerse is now regarded as one of Handel's greatest achievements in opera, and one of his best-known works is the very first aria, uh, when the curtain goes up at the beginning of Act One, the aria Ombra Mai Fu, uh, this incredibly beautiful love song. It's actually the hero sitting under a tree and singing about how beautiful the tree is. Very mundane, and yet Handel infuses it with this absolutely extraordinary sublimity. And it's such a popular tune, it became known for many generations simply as Handel's Largo. If you're of a certain generation, that phrase may sound familiar. 
And Handel, as we've seen, is smart. He's a savvy composer, savvy businessman. But with this change in um, societal um, ideals or wants when it comes to Italian opera, and that starts to fade for Handel, him being savvy, he turns back to what he was doing decades before, oratorio, um, that kind of um, music, the operatic dramaticism without the um, stage setting and costumes, which were very elaborate, one of which is um, Israel and Egypt. This is fascinating because he's depicting so directly in the music things like um, um, plagues, like flies. The Red Sea overwhelming the enemies, and it's just so dramatic in the music. I mean, it almost feels Hollywood-esque the way it's all being played out. Uh, Handel's skill as a dramatist is uh, quite evident even when there's no physical staging to showcase the drama. And of course, English oratorio was a new genre. Uh, Handel arguably might be the first composer to write an oratorio to an English language text. Interestingly enough, most of the oratorios, not all, but most of the oratorios of Handel are on sacred subjects. And Israel and Egypt, in fact, like Messiah, actually takes its text from from the scriptures. Many other oratorios that have a sacred subject are poetic paraphrases of stories from the Bible and so forth. Look at Solomon, for instance. So one of the reasons for this is that during the Lenten season, uh, often opera was either uh, put on hold or banned at various points in British history. So there needed to be a venue for people to enjoy dramatic music without actually going to the opera house. And so Handel, as you said, being the savvy businessman that he was, uh, was able to fill that need. And Messiah, which has become, I mean, anyone on the street, if you play it, they'll, they'll probably recognize the big hallelujah chorus, of course. This was actually the subject of episode number nine of Classical Breakdown. We really go into all of the details, and there's a lot when it, came, when it comes to uh, Messiah. But he composed this in 1741. It premieres in 1742 in Dublin. As, as we know, as you said, um, there's, a, there's a hold on opera for the theaters um, during Lent. And it was a charity event in which he raised um, a lot of money for, um, I believe, a children's orphanage or, uh, or the hospital. And this happened several times, even decades later. This music is being used at charity events, and it is just one of his um, just undeniable, you know, biggest hit, if you can say that. That takes us to the third thing you probably did not know about Handel, and that was in 1751, now up there in, um, in years, he undergoes eye surgery for um, a cataract. John Taylor is the person who we now refer to as a medical charlatan who operated on Handel, probably made his eyesight worse, leading to his blindness. And this is something that happened reportedly to hundreds of people. But the whole point you probably didn't know is that this same doctor, quote unquote, operated on Johann Sebastian Bach, who died of those complications just a few months later. They never met, but they, they hey, they met the same doctor, unfortunately. Quack doctor. Uh, yeah, Bach died in 1750 after one of these surgeries, possibly because the uh, surgery uh, made his condition worse. We're not sure, but we do know this John Taylor was definitely a fraud and uh, mutilated a lot of people, including Handel. And eight years later, in 1759, at the age of 74, Handel dies at his home on, uh, on Brook Street, Having lived this, really, this life of celebrity, the most famous composer, I think, um, alive at that point. So he, he, he dies also um, wealthy as well, which I think is a juxtaposition compared to someone like J.S. Bach. We often say a genius is never appreciated in his own time, but it's really not very much applicable to Handel. He was yeah. uh, a beloved figure and uh, very much respected and admired as a composer, and still is. So if you've made it this far into a podcast about Handel, well, thank you. And you probably might like to hear some music that we recommend listening to. We're going to put a Spotify playlist on the show notes page. But one thing I do recommend, what we heard earlier, the La Resurrezione, the Resurrection, but also really his, um, his organ concertos. I think they're really the first of their kind and easy to listen to and digest because they were meant to be played as interludes between bigger works that he would have been playing in theater. So these were interludes. They are very 
I don't know. I think they're very, very interesting. And they're not like big cathedral organ works. These are very, these are much, much smaller. But they're very, very nice to listen to. Do you have anything, Evan, for um, maybe something that people could listen um, out for that they may not know already? So many things. Uh, such a prolific composer, and anything you listen to by Handel is likely to be a thrill. I'm particularly uh, attached to quite a few of the operas, including, uh, we mentioned Alcina earlier, Ario Dante is another opera that I really love, uh, pretty much any Amadigi di Gaula, pretty much any opera of Handel's is going to be exciting. The Opus 6 and Opus 3 Concerti Grossi are wonderful orchestral works full of marvelous invention. And uh, I would also recommend the Oratorio Solomon. The poetry is not that great, but uh, again, Handel is able to rise above that, telling very uh, compelling stories with his incredible music. And we'll have more information on those on the show notes page. Well, thank you so much, Evan, for joining me to talk all about Handel. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown, your guide to classical music. For more information about this episode, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. You can send episode ideas and questions to classicalbreakdown at weta.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, leave a five-star review in your podcast app and tell a friend. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from WETA Classical. Classical.